All right, last week we were covering colorization. Uh, so I'll just start again from that. Uh, Denoising autoencoder is the uh, method by which you take a raw data point and you mask and you mask certain dimensions in it, and then you try to reconstruct the uh, entire thing. And you could prioritize the loss over the uh, mask units, or compared to the, just reconstructing what's already there, and hope that uh, this representation learns something about the underlying structure of the data manifold. And, and the reason was that the denoising autoencoder tries to uh, get the distorted points back to the data manifold at a different location. So it, it has to understand the tangent to the uh, manifold plane and try to minimize the, uh, try, try to basically move points based on how far they are away from that manifold to get, get it back there onto the tangent. So uh, if it's optimized this objective well, it's understood the data manifold. But uh, you can think about doing more uh, like, like clever things, uh, basically where uh, you don't just uh, reconstruct but the noisy values, but you could think about your data having multiple views and try to reconstruct one view from another. So that's, that's something that could be done. Uh, for instance, uh, take an image. Uh, so there's another color parameterization for images. Uh, apart from RGB, you can also have the LAB uh, color parameterization. So it's again a three-channel image, but it's just like the, this is actually a fish, and the grayscale would contain the structure of this fish. The LAB, the, the AB channels would contain the color. And uh, when you add it, it'll look like an actual image that you see in general. So. This way, what you could do is you, you could take the uh, L channel, uh, which would be like a one channel input, and pass it through an encoder. Then you could decode the AB channels. So uh, the hope is that you, you would know what, what each thing would correspond to. So for instance, you, you kind of understand this is one particular structure, this is another, and then there's this whole body, remaining body, and then these are all rocks. So you, you understand these kind of high level uh, textures. So semantics, uh, actually I shouldn't say semantics, it, it's more syntactic. Uh, it, so you, you just kind of understand that uh, certain pixels group together because they are colored the same. So that, that means that if you're, if you're able to solve this task, uh, the encoder hopefully learns some things that are useful to uh, allow you to classify uh, downstream. Um, so again, ideas are all good, but the devil is in the details. So if you just implement a, a naive mean square error uh, model, you're, you're, gonna be, you're not gonna be able to get good results because it's gonna converge to the mean degenerate color and it's gonna look very uninteresting. So imagine this was, this was gray and no color. So this is what the network would output. Uh, so what the authors figured out, uh, so this was a paper from Berkeley, from uh, Alio Shayifros' group. Uh, so they figured out that if you could borrow the tricks from all these autoregressive models and use, uh, basically you take the AB, a, uh, basically you take the AB uh, channels of the entire data set and figure out uh, the max and min, bin the uh, outputs instead of having a continuous value and uh, try to, uh, try to do classification based on uh, outputting which bin each pixel corresponds to for A and B channels, you would get a much more colorful output like this. So uh, this way you're optimizing the objective that you cared about and hope that that encoder ho learned much better representations compared to L2 regression. So uh, this is what I was talking about, this is the mean square error. Instead of doing this, if you figure out a Q, that's the number of bins, and then you do a regular cross entropy. Uh, so both are likelihood based objectives, but you know, in practice, this behaves much better. In general, like that's the guideline. That's like a deep learning secret. It just, whenever you can bin something, you, just, you should just bin it. Uh, and this is average over all the pixels, all the bins, and between the uh, 
what, are, what your network predicts, what is the true value. You do this over an entire data set. Uh, another way of doing this is uh, even like another another clever way of doing this is to say that let's say this is the L channel and this is the AB channel. So these are two different views. Instead of just trying to predict AB from L, what you could do is you have two different uh, two parts of the encoder. One is F1 and F2. F2 encodes AB. F1 encodes L. In the previous pipeline, you would only encode L and reconstruct AB. Now you would encode both of these. And you want to get back the original image, but you want to get it in such a way that L gives you the prediction for AB, and AB gives you the prediction for L. So, and you add again, you, you can, you add the two channels uh, so that you would again get back an actual uh, three-channel image. And now you just uh, try to make sure that X hat uh, equal to X. Where, where this is this is a regular autoencoder, but you're splitting the views. So they call this the split brain autoencoder. So this is how it would work. Take the input image, uh, A, B, L, and then you predict A, B hat here, L hat here, add it again, and you uh, make sure that this and this match. And you, could, you could also do this for uh, different uh, RGB, uh, different RGB, depth, so let's say you have the RGB channels, let's say you also have depth information, if, if your data set has uh, some 3D notion, and uh, you could try to get the uh, depth from the RGB channels, and uh, RGB channels from the depth, and uh, learn, learn really good representations. Uh, question, will F1 give you trivial identity map? Uh, in which case? Uh, so F, if F1 is identity map, uh -huh. F2 is identity map, mm -hmm. because Eventually, you combine the two, right? Mm -hmm. So it's well also a good reconstruction. Oh, I see. But you're not going to output in the same space, right? Oh. So when you output a b hat, it's going to be two channels. Oh. So it's going to be an identity. But in practice, like something like that could happen mm -hmm. in the encoder, okay. uh, not. Like like we like this method is not like a very standard approach. Uh, it's like a cute idea, and I, I just wanted to present it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so that is the cognitive principle of predicting one view from another. Uh, here is another cognitive principle, uh, which is basically doing visual common sense tasks. So the idea behind it is as follows. Uh, if you want, uh, if you want self-supervised learning to work, you force the network to solve some uh, puzzles, visual puzzles, and just like how children play with jigsaw puzzles and they understand structure of the world. Like say you construct, let's say the jigsaw puzzle is about an elephant, and and somehow they figure it out. So that means they understand the geometry of what, or. or structure of how an elephant looks, they, they can identify a real elephant once they've actually solved it. So you, you, you want to borrow those uh, inspiration and try to see if neural networks can also do that. Uh, another inspiration for this was Word2Vec. We, we'll actually cover Word2Vec subsequently, but uh, for those of you who are already familiar with it, since it's pretty popular, uh, Word2Vec tries to make sure that uh, words that are occurring near, nearby each other are related. So similarly, uh, it, it, so it tries to predict what is the neighboring word from a given word. So if you could do the same thing for like an image patch. So if you have a big image, it ha there are a lot of image patches around. So if you could do some, if you could construct some tasks where you try to predict what this patch is related to this patch, then, then that, the, the, that kind of encodes some common sense into the representations. So th this is again a paper from uh, Alyosha Yufros. Uh, so what what what, the, what 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 they're trying to do over here is they would get these uh, nine patches, for instance, from the image, uh, numbered one, two, three, uh, so on. Yeah. So th this is this this is the central patch, and relative to the central patch, the other eight patches are going to be numbered. Uh, so what the, what the what the network will try to do now is basically take the central patch, which is this and feed one of the other patches and output 
the relative position. So there are eight possible outputs. So it's basically a softmax classifier over eight different categories. So if you do this over several images where you, you construct, you, you pick one particular central crop and take all these uh, surrounding patches uh, as long as there's no overlap over here. So these, if, you, if there's an overlap, it's very easy to predict. Uh, you could just match the pixels on the uh, borders and try to like, get the related location. So uh, they try to ensure that there's a separation. Uh, and if, as long as you can do all this pre-processing cleverly uh, and you optimize this over several different patches, uh, you hope that uh, whatever CNN you learn through this way can be useful for downstream tasks. So, th so that, that's the idea over here. And like I said, they, they make sure that the patches are having gaps, they're converted to grayscale, uh, and they're also jittered. So, so the, the, these are to avoid the usual cheating techniques that uh, you, you get because of pixels overlap or colors, just matching the colors. So, so that's, that's referred to as chromatic aberration in computer vision. Uh, so apparently this was pretty non-trivial. So uh, I, I, I heard from uh, EFROS that they actually took a month or two to figure this out. So they tried all this and, not, and optimized the task. So the task worked. The, the objective kept going down all the time. But if you took the features out and tried, tried on a downstream task, it wasn't really useful. So it took them a long time to figure these things out. And uh, this paper was really, this paper is really important because the kind of tricks it figured out to make sure the pre-processing is done right, uh, all the gaps and all the jitters, uh, is, those are adopted in all the subsequent subsupervised learning literature. So, uh, so this, this is one of the first papers which actually tried something like this. Yeah. Why does jittering the patch location make a difference? Uh, yeah. So if you had a patch. So let's say you just picked some kind of overlap, patch, overlapping patches over here. Now, to know relative to this central patch, if, if, if I had to identify the location was say four, I mean, I think six, five over here, I just have to look at these uh, pixels in the border for each of those patches. The CNN could just ignore the rest. So it's not going to understand any semantics. Oh yeah, jittering is not an overlap. Jittering is for this chromatic aberration problem, which I don't properly understand. It's a, it's a computer vision thing. Um, but uh, yeah. Seeing the, the, the pixels lead into each other somehow? Yeah. In some fixed pattern? Yeah. Cool. And so this led inspiration to another paper, which basically thought, OK, instead of just outputting these categories for the relative location, why not just ask it to solve a jigsaw puzzle, like actual children solving it? So you would just jumble it, like a random permutation would be taken, and you'd be asked to identify what permutation was it. So you're not actually outputting the correct uh, ordering. So the way it's implemented is you take these patches, there's a big hash map where you have a bunch of uh, permutation orderings and like the hash ID for that. And given this to the network, it'll just output the corresponding ID. So this is, you have a particular permutation index, you just have to identify this index given the uh, random ordering. And the network's going to take in the uh, each patch one one to nine, and output the corresponding category. Same encoder for all the patches. Uh, regular architecture like AlexNet or ResNet. So that's that's the idea over here. And same kind of pre-processing as the uh, previous paper. Uh, I'll, I'll try to present all the performance numbers for these in the context of all the methods put together. So it may seem like, OK, I'm presenting another one idea after the other. But I want to make sure that all the numbers are in one place. So j just wait for a while. 
All right. So another principle is like super, super easy. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of surprising that it actually works really well, is just predicting the rotation. Uh, so yeah, you take an image, you rotate it by one of these angles, 90, 180, 270, or just have it normally. Take a CNN and ask the CNN to output which, which angle it was, uh, four categories, classifier. You do this over like lots of images, and that CNN learns good representations. So you're constructing labels for free over here by making these transformations, which is, which is basically just a rotation, and hoping that the encoder learns something useful. Uh, wh wh why does it even work? Uh, it, 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 it's, some, it's kind of a global transformation. So if, if you're trying to solve this task yourself, like, you're able to understand this is tilted this way, uh, like 270 degrees, uh, because you, you, you know that this is usually vertical in an image, and uh, some kind of a tower-like st structure. And, uh, so you, and, and here it's like 180 degrees flipped, because you know that these are faces, so, and faces are usually normally captured. So think about this as understand, like, like say there, there's a camera and you get the image. Um, there's a bunch of camera parameters. Uh, one of the camera parameters is the angle of the orientation. And so you're trying to go back from the image to one of these parameters. So some people try to think of computer vision itself as inverse graphics, where there's an actual render, which is how the world is. And to solve computer vision, you need to figure out the parameters of that render. So you, th this is just the simplest thing you could do from that inspiration. So the architecture is super simple. Take the image, uh, create your random transformations, and pass all of them to the connet and predict the uh, corresponding rotation. And they did a bunch of ablations to see how many different rotations you need. And turns out that if you just do the multiples of 90 degrees, you get the best results on CIFAR. So that's how this model is actually implemented. Like it's not, it's, yeah, it's not like having more and more transformations helps. Okay, um, here are some numbers. Uh, so what, 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 are the, what do these numbers mean? So let's say you train like the same cognitive architecture on these different uh, cognitive principles. So this, this one is the relative patch, uh, and this one is the colorization, this is the jigsaw puzzles. You can ignore the other things for now, uh, and uh, this one is the rotation. So you take the corresponding con layers at, that they mentioned, like say the fourth layer or the fifth layer, uh, just take that out, uh, build a linear classifier, or, or, or actually you, you, what, what you could do is you could uh, fine tune the entire model too. So the, the earlier the evaluation procedures were uh, very, very different across different publishers. So sometimes the tables might not actually be correct. Like for instance, the numbers they quote from another paper might have evaluated in a different way. So I'll again come back to these numbers in the context of a final paper that I'll present. But uh, I'm just trying to motivate what the downstream task is. The downstream task is you train this on unlabeled data, uh, say ImageNet data set, and you uh, assume that suddenly labels start coming. You build a linear classifier at the end. You t just take the con net, add a softmax over 1,000 categories, just predict the largest over 1,000 categories, and train, the, train it on a training set, and show the performance on a validation set. Why does it make sense? Uh, it makes sense if you, uh, let's say you freeze all the features up till then, the cons, you build a linear layer and try to predict something. Uh, if your features are good, uh, they've captured enough about the data that you can do any downstream task you want. Uh, so you should be able to do supervised learning, like, like object detection. You should be able to do segmentation. You should be able to do captioning. You should be able to do like 
several downstream tasks from one single set of features. Uh, if that works, then unsupervised learning really works. That's not the case yet, but that's, that's the motivation for uh, this kind of an evaluation, where you just take one of the con layers and, and try to add a classifier at the end. Question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the the encoder is frozen, and a linear classifier is added at the end. Okay. Yeah. So it's just the difference between the end or in the middle. Different data set here. Uh, yeah, this is C for ten. Yeah, oh. sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's hard to do a lot of ablations on ImageNet because it's more large scale. Uh, so this was done on C for ten. I I I'll get back to ImageNet. Evaluation at the end again. Uh, in the, the next slide is ImageNet, but these numbers are, it's not clear if all the papers are uniformly evaluated here. So there is one paper which does that, and I will be talking about it. Is higher better, by the way? Sorry? Is higher better in accuracy or error rate? Oh, this is, this is the top one accuracy. So, this, so in ImageNet, people report two different numbers. Uh, the top one and top five percent, which is basically that you predict the largest for each class, and top one is if your largest for the correct class is the maximum, and top five is the largest for the correct class is among the top five of all the thousand largests. If if it's a thousand class problem, so these numbers are the top one percentage on ImageNet. If you pre-train, uh, say the rotation loss on ImageNet and build a linear classifier at the end. And I'd, like you could use any of these three different convolutions and build a classifier after, on top of that and uh, train on all the training images and report these numbers in the validation set. So that's not clear. Oh, um, so. Yeah, that's not clear to me yet what, what, what actually these people did. So I wouldn't really, yeah, I wouldn't really say anything about it. Uh, but I can tell you what the number is for AlexNet. AlexNet, it's uh, the top one accuracy is 63 point something percentage uh, on the validation set. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's, that's not the state of the art obviously now, right? Uh, that, so the state of the art is around 77 or 78, uh, close, close to 80%. So you can clearly see that these numbers are really, really far away from supervised learning. How many can they train on? How many what? How many can they train on in the training? They get the same training set? Oh, yeah. So, so Peter's question was, what is the training set? So you get the same training set as supervised learning. So imagine that you're, 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 you're just starting with a bunch of features. You're not allowed to change it. Uh, you, but you, you can do whatever you want on top of that. How far can you get? That, that, that's what this evaluation is about. Uh, and it makes sense. That it's hard to do something uh, that's very quantitative as this. You can do a lot of nearest neighbor evaluations or qu qualitative uh, visualizations or representations. But in terms of number benchmarking, uh, the best thing you can do is take the unsupervised features, add a downstream task. Now, if the downstream task is not uh, related to what you've trained on, uh, like say, uh, if, if you're training on ImageNet and then you're using it on CIFAR, it's fine fine-tuning it. Uh, it makes sense if the thing that you're fine-tuning on doesn't have enough data that even if you train something supervised from scratch, you wouldn't get great numbers. But the unsupervised features help you to get great numbers. So that's typically... Uh, the case in NLP research, where uh, you, you, you can train language models on really large corpora, and then the actual evaluation uh, domain doesn't really have a lot of labels, or it's, it's a small enough data set. And, and therefore, even, even if you just try succeeding, uh, try training a supervised model on that small data set, whatever performance you get is nothing compared to like starting from another set of features and fine-tuning the entire model. That's not the case in computer vision, though, because 
image net is really, really large. So if you just do regular supervised learning on that, it, you, you're going to get really, really state-of-the-art results. So it's not like you, uh, un unsupervised learning allows you to do anything better. The, the point of evaluation is more like, uh, I, I, this is more like an academic evaluation, just to see how good the features are. classify the rotation, yeah. then you add the classifier at the end so you to yeah. Get yeah. the label yeah. right. So, so let's say you have the encoder, uh, you have the image, and initially the uh, rotation predicts like four, four logits. Mm -hmm. Now you, you, you just throw this out okay. and have another thousand logits and try to like freeze this and just train this part. I mean, I'm sure like peop you've done all this, like let's say, uh, I don't know, if, if you've used word to vec or something, like before deep learning really picked up. Yeah. Cool. Um, so again, uh, the next cognitive principle is that color, col c color is something that uh, is coherent across time in a, vi in a video. Uh, so if you're given a colored video, I mean videos are colored. Uh, so you, if you have a f frame that's grayscale and that's part of the video, and if you have another frame in the video that's colored, if you can copy the colors of the same objects, uh, if you can somehow train a network to do that, then the network has to understand that uh, groups of pixels that move together have the same color. So if, let's say if this car is over here and another frame is actually over here, and, in, in, and say one of these frames is grayscale, one of the frames is color, if you can somehow copy the color of the car from one frame to another, you understood that there's an object like the car in the in the in a particular frame. So uh, so he here's a girl, and, and so let's say this is actually a video where she's doing some kind of a stunt at home, and you're trying to copy the color from this frame to another from this frame. So you you have so she's she's wearing a pink T-shirt, and even though she's upside down here, you can actually uh, copy the color from this particular frame to this. So you you understand that the girl is actually moved from one frame to another. So that 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 that's you can think about this basically as a tracker or an optical flow, uh, where you're tracking pixels that move together, and the ground truth for that comes from the color. So in practice, this is how it would look. So imagine this is one pixel, and this is the reference frame and the input frame, and you actually have the reference colors. Again, this paper also uses the LAB parameterization. Um, so the input frame doesn't have colors for the, as far as the encoder is concerned. And the embedding for this pixel, let's say it's FJ, some vector, and the embedding for this pixel, let's say it's fi, another vector, and the color corresponding to that is ci in the ab space. You want to make sure that, so for if you have a bunch of candidate eyes across all the pixels in the reference frame, you want to have this pointer, aij, that measures how similar fi is with fj, and based on that, copies a weighted combination of all these ci's and figures out a target CJ. And then you compare it to the ground truth and backpropagate that loss. So reference frame here, target frame here, both are encoded with the same CNN. Uh, these are in the uh, L space. And you have a, so, the, so let's say if, if this is a 64 cross 64 uh, frame, let's say the video is 64 cross 64 each frame. Uh, you can actually have a smaller uh, hidden dimension, say 32 or 32. 
The, the reason they give is that color is not like super high frequency, so it's okay to go to a lower dimensional space. You don't really lose much. So now in this frame, you're understanding how each pixel embedding is uh, at that location. Uh, it's wrong to call it pixel, but let's just say each spatial embedding location depends on another spatial embedding location. So this is exactly what you do in self-tension, where you just take all the pixel encodings and you compare each of them. So you compare CI's embedding with all of other uh, FJs, FIs, and FJs, and come up with this uh, attention map. Oops. Mm. Let's see. I'm not sure actually how to use the eraser here. Okay. Um, this one, can you click on that one? It's not sticking. It's not available. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, I can, I can write it down, No mind. So AIJ is uh, E par FI transpose FJ by sigma e power fk transpose fj, where k is all the locations. And so you're basically trying to figure out for all different j's how much the correlation is for that spatial embedding with i. And this is just self-tension. And you get a score target prediction for the color of that location as this weighted combination times the actual ground truth colors in that reference frame. So reference frame, you already know the AB values. So for the target frame at each I, each J or I, whatever, you, 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 get, you get the uh, uh, weighted combination. All these are probabilities, so you, it, would, it makes sense. Uh, and then you, you have the ground truth while training, so you try to make sure that CJ hat matches the true CJ at every pixel. So, so this is like the, 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 the colorization paper, but with this tracker, with this attention mechanism, part of the architecture. Makes sense? Any, any questions on this? No, the original is 64, and you do a regular ResNet embedding where there is a strided con, you get a 32, and then you do this tracker there. And so it's not actually like tracking the exact pixels, but it's more the inductive bias that you get from this. Uh, one thing I should mention is the embeddings for each, uh, each of these locations also has the position encoding just like how transformers use position encodings for pixels or text. So that, that lets the model also understand where each embedding is. So just as the equation doesn't tell anything, but the mo the, the, it's actually uh, concatenated. Instead of adding, it's concatenated to these uh, ResNet encodings. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's the assumption this paper makes, where uh, nothing new appears in a frame. It's like you have the same set of objects moving around. So any future frame, whatever colors are present in every pixel can be copied from a, a pixel in the source frame. Uh, so you hope that the AIJ value uh, basically is very sparse. That uh, you just, the, even though it's like a weighted combination, that's only for making it differentiable. But in practice, it might turn out to be that this tracker is very sparse, that you actually basically learn a tracker where AIJ basically says 
Oh, in that frame, this pixel is over there. Okay. Yeah. So you're just hoping that like, the AIJ put, like, for pixels that belong to the same object are like very close to one with the other. So they're right. Just yeah. Yeah. So, so in, in vi computer vision, people call this pixel groupings or learning, learning groupings. So, and yeah, these are, these are RGB and these are the a, a B channels. And if you quantize it, I, 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 I don't, I don't, I, I didn't show you what the quantize version looks like. This is how it looks like. So you basically take different AB values over all pixels, over all images in the training data set, run k-means on that, and get these segmentation-like looking versions. In fact, if you, if you read Machine Learning by Bishop, this is basically how people used to do segmentation uh, in like 80s and 90s. They would just do k-means or uh, EM with mixture of Gaussians and get these approximate looking segments. So when, I, when, when, when all these CIs, the ground truth CIs, the target CIs, these are actually in, in this space, the quantized space. So if you, if, you think, if you think like you would be able to just go home, implement this with the RGB values, it's not gonna work. All the, these, these inductive biases are super important. So here, here are some results. So the reference frame, uh, and this is the future frame, which is gray, and the model predicts the colors pretty well. So you can understand, so the balloon was small in the previous frame, got enlarged because, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so it understood, uh, it understood that the balloon got enlarged, so it tracked the balloon, basically. And uh, here there is a bread, and, and the, someone has moved the bread, moved the plate, or the camera has moved, and, uh, but it still understood what, what's happening and rightly colored. Like actually they applied cheese, uh, they spread the cheese, so it's tracked what's happened. And, and here there's a dancing frame and uh, their arms are moved up and still able to get it right. So this paper has nothing to do with the ImageNet part. The, this is about, this is a video segmentation or tracking paper. So, but it's really, really cool. So imagine if you have a gray video and someone just colored the first frame, like some artist or someone, some human just colored this bird, the body of the bird. And the subsequent frames can be tracked based on that color because you learn the tracker. Now you, all you have to do is run the tracker on whatever the human annotated in the first frame. So basically, th this is evidence that the tracking actually works. And even, even for high, high, high FPS, like high en entropy videos like this, where the uh, car is moving really fast, it's able to get it right. The ball rolling around, and uh, two people, I don't know if it's karate, yeah, so, so it, it can even keep track of two separate people. Usually segmentation suffer from cases when two humans are very close by. Uh, it groups them into like a one single body, but this one's actually able to understand they're two different people. Cool. Um, so that, that completes this cognitive principle. The final cognitive principle is a slide we saw in the beginning, and uh, I just like this slide a lot. This is from Jan LeCun. Uh, I actually think if we succeed in this, like we're gonna get super far. Uh, where if you can figure out a clever way to implement in parallel all these four different things, future from the past, future from the recent past, past from the present, top from the bottom. Like imagine you have a video there's space and there's also time. And uh, you mask out some parts of the video, like at every frame, like some parts of the video are missing at every frame. And you just train a model to fill it. Uh, and if this masking is really, really random, such that you can't really cheat. O obviously you'll have to 
do a lot of engineering to ensure that there are no cheating going on. But if, if, if you can ensure that, and if you do manage to train a model to succeed on this, like on all of YouTube or something, then uh, it, it's very likely that whatever you encode has really gone far in understanding general perception. So that, that's the motivation for this slide. And, and this isn't true specific to videos or pixels. Like it's true for like other modalities to speech or uh, language, everything else. Control, you could have actions part of the uh, input. So just a brief primer on word embeddings before we go into this principle. So I've actually taken this from this course called 2 to 4N at Stanford, taught by Manning and Socher. Uh, so people used to work on word embeddings in the, like say, 2012, 13 times, where uh, you would have a vocabulary and you don't want to have these monolithic embeddings where each word is just assigned a one hot over the total number of categories, which is the vocabulary size. Because this doesn't tell you anything. All the words are orthogonal to each other here. So you can't understand which words are correlated, which words are similar, which words have same meaning and stuff. So um, one way people used to work with this was take documents. Uh, documents are basically sentences. So a sentence is also a document. So see if you have a sentence like, I enjoy flying, the rep the re you can construct a matrix where uh, or, or let's say you have a, a, a matrix like this, where there's a bunch of terms and documents, and you just have a encoding for how many times each word occurred there. And you constructed this uh, matrix. Where, or, or, or actually, this is a co-occurrence matrix, where you just construct how many times I and like occur together, which is two here. So how many times I and enjoy occur together, which is one, how many times uh, say learning and deep, yeah. So, so th these kind of co-occurrences patterns. And uh, if, if you can construct a matrix like this and run a SVD on that uh, single value decomposition and take the top K components, you get some embeddings for the words, some embeddings for all the initial granular atomic tokens. So this is really how people used to work earlier on topic models and stuff. Uh, and uh, there are, it, 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 it works reasonably well. Like it's possible that these vectors are all corresponding to some kind of uh, underlying topics like deep learning or something in, in this case. But uh, it, it's not used anymore or, or it's probably not very widely used anymore. Uh, just like how eigenfaces in like PCA for computer vision is not really used anymore. It works really well, but uh, it, these are not things that can scale well. The S SVD calculation is pretty, uh, yeah, the SVD calculation is quadratic. And then uh, you can, it might not work if you have really infrequent words in your documents. And frequent words can add a lot of noise to how this matrix is constructed. Uh, NLP people came up with a lot of hacks, like using term frequency, inverse document frequency, instead of just using term frequency, and, uh, and then trying to construct these embeddings. But uh, you know, like deep learning has actually replaced all these. So before going to the deep learning part, I uh, just want to point out something that is very trivial, but profound. So people used to work on n-gram language models before, where they would construct, so this is the simplest thing. You just ignore ordering. You just, uh, you know, calculate the frequency of all the words. Just output it, output, output every word based on like how frequent, how how likely it is based on the frequency. So, you might just keep outputting these or a or something like that. It's very very dumb. And another thing you could do is a bigram model where you, you just condition on the previous thing and, and and model occurrences of pairs of words instead of one single word. Uh, and then you output bigrams based on what you've output so far. Uh, again, this is not really going to be scalable. Uh, so the reason I wanted to point these two, two things out is because you've seen flow models or autoregressive flows in, or in general autoregressive models where 
we had this DAG kind of a structure where like you, you for the, gener the most generic autoregressive model, you would, uh, you would have the all possible dependencies from the past. So when you're modeling uh, this particular unit, you're gonna have a connection from this, 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 and this. So it's gonna be as expressive as possible. So that's what you want in language models as well. So that's why deep learning models work much better than these hard-coded statistical language models because they make limiting assumptions like, oh, okay, I just need to worry about this connection. I don't have to care about this. So yeah, and another thing is uh, in deep learning, you're sharing the parameters of the underlying model across different time steps. Uh, you could do that even in statistical language models, but it turned, like deep learning is just way better at learning these commonalities across time steps in a more scalable way. So now that you know what a word embedding is, just want to get vectors for words. This is one of the first papers which succeeded at this mission, which is word to vec. And in fact, this whole idea of calling x to y started from this paper, word to vec, uh, done by Mikolov and um, other people at Google. Um, so there are two, two types of word to vec models that, are, that, that, that Mikolov proposes in that paper. One is called CBOW or continuous bag of words. The other is called skipgram. They're kind of mirror images of each other. So, so let's say you had a sentence like, say, I'm teaching now. And so let's say this is the center word. And the CBOW model would take in I, am, now, and try to predict what the center word is. It would do this over different pairs of like, say, phrases or sentences. It could take a big billion words document and keep parsing uh, different parts of it. Uh, you fix the context size and take everything except the center and predict the center. So that's the CBOW model. The skipgram model does the opposite, which is it takes the center, which is teaching, and it ignores the ordering for I, am, and now, but all it cares about is saying that the embedding for teaching should be highly correlated with the embedding for I, am, and now. So if I took an input embedding for teaching and projected it to some hidden layer, and if I had a bunch of output embeddings for all the words in the vocabulary, I need to make sure that uh, the embeddings of the output were output vocabulary, the, the, the output embeddings of the vocabulary uh, are highly correlated for these three words with the input embedding of teaching. And I need to do this for different co-occurrences of different words in the document. So this would ensure that words that are occurring nearby are similar. And words that are occurring with similar terms are similar. It's, it, it'll be transitive because the distributed representations make it transitive. So that's the idea of skip gram. But both are doing soft maxes uh, in a contrastive way. Marvin, yeah. What is a little circles mean? Over here? Yeah. Oh, these are just meaning the soft max units. Like people used to draw neural networks earlier like this, right? But, I mean, where is the word? Is, it, is that the one hot encoding? Yeah, so this is the one hot encoding. This is the hidden representation. And each of these different outputs are softmax over mod vocabulary. So you would have as many softmax layers as the context size. And you would try to make sure that for this softmax, the cross entropy is optimized for i. For this, it's optimized for m. For this, it's optimized for now, given the embedding for teaching. And for another sentence, say, I'm writing here. Here, I would take writing, and I would do the same for I am here. So it's likely that because of this, writing and teaching are correlated, because they both try to predict I and M. So the, that cross entropy loss for I and M, and the output was back propagated to the same input embedding. So it's very likely that the embedding for teaching is correlated with the embedding for writing, which makes sense. So uh, yeah, so that, that, that's, that's how word to vec works. 
So these, these are two different versions of it, and both were implemented in the paper. No. You only get, you only get one word to predict all the neighboring words? Yeah. And you do this for different context words. Uh, note that the speciality about this paper was it was implemented with so much good engineering that no GPUs are needed, and it would still train in a day, and you would still get amazing embeddings. You could just train it on CPU and um, run completely in C++ before any neural net packages were available. So people would just download the embeddings and use it. Um, so I'm going to present the CBOL this the uh, I'm just going to gloss over the CBOL model, but I'll, I'll be more interested in the skipgram because that's connected to the next visual representation learning method we'll talk about. But the CBOL model is pretty obvious. So you're just trying to predict Given this particular condition, conditioning context, there's all the surrounding words. You're predicting the, that the, you're, you're trying to maximize the probability of the center word. And the way this conditioning model is implemented is super easy. Uh, it's, it's not like a transformer or anything. The, word, the, the embeddings, the input embeddings for all these words are just average. So you just take the, uh, say, f of, W, C, I, C minus I, and this average over the context size. And you get a vector V hat. And you're just trying to optimize the log prob of the true UC over all the possible UJs. Uh, UC is the center word, and UJs are all possible words in the vocabulary. And that's it. That, that, that's how it's implemented. Back in, that, back in those days, people were worried about this term here, over here. Because if the vocabulary is really large, there's no way to implement this efficiently without a GPU. So Mikulov used something called hierarchical softmax. You're, you're encouraged to go check it out, uh, where they, he uses the Huffman encoding of text and tries to figure out a hierarchical pathway to predicting so these different softmaxes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not covering here, but just pointing out that the engineering challenges were very different from what you, you do it now, because now you can just have a, a model predict things over like 80,000 categories with a softmax and not worry about all this. Just, just implement it on a GPU. Um, why you had is just the average of oh, He just want, oh, so, so the question was, why are, for the conditioning part, why am I just averaging the surrounding words? Mm -hmm. Why can't I add like a, MLP or transformer or something like that. First of all, they were not known in those days. Secondly, uh, uh, like even, even an RNN was not used because there's this nice linearizing property of this whole thing where if you somehow manage to optimize this, there's no nonlinearity here. So this is just a lookup table. And this is again another lookup table. So you're just having a softmax loss, which is, which is just regular cross entropy objective. So if you somehow succeed here, you can do arithmetic, averaging, things like that. Sum up two, two different, sum up the embeddings for two different words, and it might mean the meaning of two together, these kind of things. I, I show you some results. So the skip gram model tries to do like what I explained when Peter asked this question, where there are going to be soft maxes for uh, each of these context words, and you're going to optimize the cross entropy for each of your words in that particular window. Uh, so you have this. Th this is your. If you if you write down the loss, it's just going to be the probabilities of all these context surrounding words given the center word. And this is like the naive base assumption, where you just say that you know, given the center word, the probabilities of the context words are independent. So so basically, getting rid of the ordering, and it doesn't matter. Like, say if there's a center word over here, and if, if I want to say probability of wt plus 1 given wt, and probability of wt minus 1 given wt, I'm going to use the same model. It doesn't matter if it's behind or ahead, or two steps ahead, three steps behind. It's going to use the same thing. And, and the way I would model the probability is again by taking the dot product and taking the dot product over all the other words in the vocabulary 
and taking a softmax of, of, of those. So uh, this is in general referred to as contrastive loss, where you, if there is a context and there's something true and there are everything else that is false, you just want to maximize the dot product between the truth and the context in, in, in comparison to the dot product between the true, uh, false things in the context. And one really, really efficient way of doing this is to softmax it and treat it as if it's a cross entropy objective. It's very stable. If you, if you try to do something like SVM with a hinge loss where you just try to maximize the uh, dot product between the truth and the context uh, over a margin uh, when, when compared to the dot products of the fa false in the context, it, it might be unstable, your embeddings might really become large, you, you might get NANDs and so on. But uh, using a uh, cross entropy objective is very stable. Uh, so so the, the, this is how the loss would end up here. Again, like I already pointed out, this is pretty memory inefficient. If you want to do it at each of the contexts, the, each of the different contexts, if you, if you want to do this, uh, you might need large, it, it basically multiplies your bat size by the, by the context. So those days people didn't have enough memory to do this. So uh, they would um, reduce the vocabulary size to, uh, to, 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 to something smaller. So let's say you can just pick a bunch of random words and su sum the denominator over only a fraction of the Entire, entire vocabulary. So the vocabulary is over 50,000 words. You can run this denominator only over 100 words or something. And you could keep doing this over multiple random pairs of 100 words and hope that it, it still works. And practice it does. And Mikolov uses some clever techniques like uh, making sure that the uh, uh, negative sampling so the, 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 this technique is called negative sampling, where picking the false words for the denominator, uh, but not summing over the entire possible space from which they can be sampled from, is called negative sampling. You're trying to be approximate in your denominator. And it's a technique that's very much uh, well known in the energy-based model literature. We, we haven't really covered energy-based models in this, in this course. But if you're interested, you, you can go and check out and, and the word negative sampling is very, very common there. Um, so Mikulov uses uh, this technique where he avoids sampling frequent words by having this thing called probability of dropping. And, and this is some threshold he sets. It's a hyperparameter. And this f is the frequency of that word in the document. So if the f is really frequent, the probability of sampling from uh, sampling that word wi uh, for, for f of wi being very high is low. So this way, uh, you, you make sure that like, things like D, R, are not being sampled for the negative examples because they're not going to convey so much information to softmax. Oh, yeah. Um, can you go back to this slide? Yeah. Um, so, this equal, so this implies that each word in the context conditioned on the center word is independent? Or is this just like a, an assumption? Yeah. It's an assumption. And it, it, it is a limiting assumption, but uh, you should understand that the intention of the author was not to like throw large models and get something, but you know, get some, some word embedding that somebody can train in a day on CPUs, like not even GPUs. And I have one more question, yeah. which is, um, I, I don't know, so can, can you comment on whether it matters that they're using like cosine similarity between word vectors? rather than learning some distance metric, like putting a, yeah. a matrix in the middle? Yeah, so that's what I was just talking about, where if you use distance space hinge losses, it might be unstable compared to using these dot products and uh, exponentiating and softmaxing them. Um, yeah, it's, it's for sta stable implementations, and empirically it works out better. Yeah, 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 whatever you learn at the end or more, yeah. Cool, so uh, look at the results. Like this, 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 this is really, really cool. Um, so these are embeddings. So you, 
let's say, say the vertex, let's say the dimension of the embedding is 100. You take a PCA, you do a PCA and take the first two components and visualize countries and capitals in 2D. So on the left are countries, right are capitals. So you can see that they're basically parallel lines. So if you draw, uh, if, you, if you basically take the distance vector or the, or the position vector starting from every country to its capital, and if you do this for all pairs of countries' capitals, you end up with approximately parallel lines. So what does this mean? It means you can do arithmetic. You can do, uh, so let's say I move from Portugal to Spain, right? And my translation to, from Lisbon to Madrid is gonna be parallel too. So that means that if I take this vector and add this, and I could subtract this. So let's say I take the word embedding of Portugal and I sub add uh, Madrid, I subtract Spain. I should get something very close to Lisbon. So th these kinds of uh, arithmetic would actually work here. So if you think about, so so many countries like that, China to Beijing, Poland to Warsaw, they're actually parallel. So obviously this is in 2D. Uh, you can't do anything more than this, but th this is really cool. And uh, so the, the thing that you asked about uh, taking the, like, like why do we average or why do we make sure everything's linear is Say what they actually did here is they summed the embeddings for these phrases and tried to do an analogical task where given Larry Page Google pair and given Werner Vogel's among the rest of all the tokens, you're gonna to pick the nearest neighbor and it correctly picks Amazon uh, because it learns the relationship that Larry Page is from Google and this guy's from Amazon. Similarly, like Steve Ballmer, Microsoft, this guy from IBM, or, or Austria, Austrian Airlines, Belgium, Brussels Airlines. So it understands that uh, this is an airline from that country. Uh, and how, how can it do that? Because it's very likely that Austria and Austrian Airlines are put together, uh, or, or, or like the kinds of, if, if you had a country and an airline together, then the embeddings for another country in our airline would likely to be similar because it, it would occur together. So, so, so basically these kind of cool analogy, analogy reasoning tasks can now be done. J zero shot, just using the embeddings. Similarly, uh, you can do, uh, let's see. So this one's uh, taking the four closest tokens. So let's say you had, uh, French plus actress, it would pick actual real actresses because the vector of the sum of these two vectors with French plus actress is the closest among all possible pairs of vectors. Similarly, uh, chess master, highly correlated with Gary Kasparov correctly. Uh, if you do, so these are two different things. This is the hierarchical softmax. This is so, some other, version of Vertebec uh, and correctly picks like chess grandmaster. So, so it makes sense. All these things are actually understanding the semantics of the words, which is what the original aim was to get embeddings for words that with which you can do a lot of zero shot uh, nearest neighbors and it would actually make sense. So similarly, these are all the closest tokens taken from uh, different models. So let's say you have a, yeah, let's, let's take Redmond. And these are all the closest phrases that are recovered. And for the Vertebec model, this trained for one day, you actually get meaningful nearest neighbors like Redmond, Washington, Microsoft. Whereas for other techniques that were pretty popular during those days, even if you trained for several weeks or months or like one week, you were not getting these correct nearest neighbors, like 
yeah, you were getting proper nouns like agarwal and stuff. Or for, for, for graffiti, you're getting actually spray paint, daggers, whereas for these, you're getting like anesthetics, monkeys, Jews. It doesn't make any sense. Che cheesecake. So, 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 I would say that trying to keep the model as simple as possible and making sure that everything is very efficiently implemented was the reason this actually worked very, very, very well. And also, important thing is how, more, how much more efficient it is in training compared to other models of the time. So the previous best was seven days. So th th this was 7x better. Cool. You can take the pizza break now. Cool. So let's continue with the rest of the lecture. Um, we are going to see like two state of the art or like really very recent advances uh, for subsupervised learning, and then uh, hopefully we can summarize the course uh, so far. So that from subs uh, yeah, I think I think next week we're not having a lecture because of spring break. And the week after that, it's going to be uh, I guess first guest lecture from Ilya. So we try to finish this by today. Um, okay, so next thing that we're going to see is contrastive predictive coding, uh, or CPC, from DeepMind. Uh, all the ideas that we've discussed with word 2 vec are just going to come back again. Uh, just see the, so think about the uh, visual representation learning ideas, uh, especially from uh, Alyosha Ifro's group. They were all like like all the relative patch position jigsaw puzzles, like the, the, these kind of ideas. They're all very very inspired from uh, word 2 vec because once like word 2 vec showed these really really cool arithmetic, everybody wanted to see how to do that for pixels. Uh, so, uh, and, and then it's hard to do it for every individual pixel, so that's why people went to patches. Um, unlike in uh, language, in, in, in vision, an atomic unit being a pixel is like really not, not that easy to scale with current compute. Um, so imagine you had a video, uh, say, one megapixel per frame, just, and then you had like really high FPS. You can, you'd be having trillions of pixels, so it's hard to learn like language models on that. Uh, and you're completely, as, as in, if you completely ignore any structure, space, time, and just think about uh, it as a bunch of bunch of bytes, uh, and try to l learn a big, huge model on that, it's, it's really hard. Uh, and uh, so you need some some notions of what is local, what is space, what is time, uh, what is a patch, um, or, or like in the uh, color the tracking paper, like what is what what, what what's actually a notion of a tracking mechanism. So these kinds of inductive biases are important in pixels, and this paper tries to take inspiration from that, uh, where instead of predicting things in the pixel space, it tries to predict things in the abstract space. Uh, so let's see how it's done. So imagine you had some raw signal. So that's the figure is drawn with a speech audio signal, but in general it could be anything. Um, but let's just take it. So imagine you had a big uh, audio signal, say uh, a, few milli a few seconds or milliseconds, whatever. Uh, and uh, you had a t up to a certain time you, you take all the audio form so far, call that as a context C, and based on this context, uh, if I ask you to predict uh, a few time steps apart uh, and call that as X, uh, one way to do that is to learn a conditional generative model that takes C and outputs X. Uh, but if all I told you is maximize the mutual information between the future and the past, just, just learn embeddings that understand that x is more likely to be the future with c compared to like this x or this x just, just, for this particular uh, gap. 
So if the gap is like th these many milliseconds away, uh, if I just want to train a model that understands that this chunk of the audio is likely to be the true future as compared to like the chunk in between or the chunk after or the, any other audio from some other waveform, some other speaker, uh, then that's going to learn some internal representation of what is the future. So instead of learning raw genital model in the raw audio space, what you're going to do is encode the context C, uh, and you're going to encode the prediction X into with the same encoder, and you call them as Z and C again. And you're going to try to maximize the mutual information between C and Z. So the way it's actually implemented is, like I said, there is a true audio signal, which is this chunk. But these are fake versions, as in for these many time steps apart, this is the only true audio signal. And all the other parts of the audio in different chunks, different time steps, are, are part of the audio in other waveforms, can be fake samples. So you take a bunch of fake samples, and you take the true sample, and just like word to vec you're trying to maximize the dot product or some, some notion of a score matching between the context C and the true ZI in relation to the context C and fake Z, ZJs. And if you do this for multiple different combinations of Cs, ZIs, and ZJs, and you know different samples, different uh, batches, and do this for like a really large encoder data set, you hope that the encoder that you get at the end learns reasonably good representations. And the specific form of the score matching here that they use is an exponential of a bilinear product, uh, where you take the ZT plus K corresponding to the true future and some weight matrix WK and multiply it with the CT. Uh, and uh, in practice, you don't have to implement it by calling, say, TF target variable of time step. Like, like that's in instead, what you could just do is uh, like encode all ZIs for every time step and just do some one cross one con. Uh, so you just get uh, targets or target ZIs for each time step. So you, 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 can, you can club these two as one op and implement it very efficiently. Um, so, Carmen, yeah. Can you go back to five? Yeah. Only what? It's X of F. Uh huh. And F is just linear. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. Right. So, so Peter uh, points out that there are two X. Yeah. That, that that that's a mistake. So that's just one X. So here F is or it's not technically. Uh, yeah. So F actually just means uh, C transpose of W C I. So yeah. Um. Cool. So this encoder for C is actually some autoregressive model. And you can pick your favorite autoregressive model. Like this is an RNN in this diagram, but it could be like a temporal convolution, mass convolution, or a mass transformer, anything. Any, any just throw any large model, and it'll work. Um, so you basically get an encoding of the history so far. and what are these different arrows? Imagine you had, say, with, this, with, with respect to this specific diagram, imagine you had four different tasks. First task is to predict one step ahead. Second task, two steps. Third task, three steps. Four, fourth task, four steps ahead. And for each of these tasks, the corresponding true value is that particular latent variable at the time step. And the fake values are every other latent variable across time. So if I write the tr fake values for ZT plus 1 for this task 1, uh, the fake samples would be ZT plus i for i not equal to 1. And if I have, so this is for one particular x. If I have other x in my batch uh, the, such that xi not equal to x, so let's say I have a mini batch size of 16, I get 15 other samples. And for each of the other samples, 
say uh, these are eight steps here. I would get eight times 15 uh, ZIs for each of those. And so total number of negative samples would be uh, 120 plus, uh, here there are, let's see, there are seven, I guess, yeah. So you, you would have a softmax over 128 categories where 127 negative examples come with 120 from samples in your mini batch that are different from your current audio form and uh, four, uh, seven from your current audio form. And this is for task for prediction step one. For prediction step two, the truth would be ZT plus two and everything else would be false. So you're, do, you're going to do like so many classification tasks for each prediction step, each context size. Uh, so imagine uh, the context size is always going to be four. And so for one step ahead, I the one task would be use these and predict this. Another task would be use these and predict this. So, so on. So it's shared across time and it's shared across prediction steps. And you basically solve hundreds or thousands of classification tasks in one single architecture uh, with a contrastive objective. Oh, yeah. Do you have to say again? Okay. Uh, I just said the mini batch size, let's assume it's 16. So apart from this X, there are 15 other X's in the batch. Yeah. Yeah, let me, let me write it down. Let's say batch size is 16. And if you want to get, so I said that contrastive loss makes a biased assumption that the vocab, vocabulary size or the number of, the, the, the true space of all negative samples uh, is small. Like say in this case, you assume it's 16 but the true space of all possible audio forms is infinite. Uh, so that means the, the, the gradient is likely to be of high variance because it depends on what samples are taken for the denominator. So one way to account for that is to parallelize this over a different course. Uh, so you can have a batch size 16 for one GPU that collects the gradient. Another GPU also has another se separate set of 16 samples. It uses those samples for its contrastive loss. And you could average the gradients of all these and uh, run your atom, atom optimizer. So this way, it, it's, it's much more stable. And uh, you, you don't really suffer from the usual uh, noise contrastive loss variance issues if you have enough, I mean, if you have sufficient compute. Makes sense? Cool. Um, so, this is the loss function. Uh, same, same thing you saw as word to vec Log probabilities of softmax. And expectation is over all possible data points. And why does this make sense? Uh, this is uh, actually m most of these pictures are taken from uh, Alex Graves tutorial at New Europe's last year. Uh, he presented CPC there. Uh, and I, I really like this figure. Uh, so imagine you had this audio form, uh, and like I said, you had this context, and here the target is over here. Uh, so this is the raw audio form at the bottom, uh, and it has very high frequency noise uh, combined with the actual raw sig uh, like useful signal. So, and as the keep going up, the features get keep getting slower. So the phone, and, and at the top, you have things like phonemes, uh, prosody that you actually care about in downstream speech recognition tasks or speaker identification, pho phoneme classification, these kind of things. Uh, but at the bottom most, you have the raw, noisy audio form. So you want to make sure that the network learns these slow features, which are useful for downstream tasks. And imagine you were going to predict something at this space, uh, your net, so you, the, the features relevant for slowness at this horizon are going to be learned. And if you're going to do the prediction step ahead in time, much, much more ahead in time, you'll be learning features that cover the uh, slowness across like several different time steps apart. So hopefully, if somehow all these objectives, all these different classification tasks are, are, are learned very well, uh, you, 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 can hope, you can be sure that 
you have learned some kind of really high level, slow, uh, high signal features that, that, that are potentially going to be super useful for downstream tasks. And th that's, that's the whole goal of unsupervised learning. Like, you want to learn some set of universal features that can potentially be useful for several different downstream tasks. And here's their uh, results on speech. So they used a library speech data set, uh, which you can actually download it's available online. And no preprocessing. So note that in WaveNet, uh, they actually use MULA preprocessing and stuff. Here, there's actually only the raw audio. Uh, uh, and, and you're running the architecture that encodes the, uh, let's, the, the GNC. Actually, it's just a, bu a bunch of strided cons. Uh, like, uh, yeah, you use different strides with different filters, uh, subsequently, uh, like re reducing the stride as the layer increases. And the autoregressive part is just an RNN. And if you, uh, GRU to be specific. So now, if you use this, uh, it turns out that. For a data set with 10 different speakers, you get these different clusters very nicely. Plus, like this is in the uh, TSNE visualization. So it means that the, the slow features are learning speaker categories, basically. And the, on the right is the prediction step accuracy. So I told you that there are different classification tasks. So for each prediction step, it's a separate classification task. And you would hope that the classification task that is like 20 steps apart is actually harder compared to like one step or two steps apart uh, because the entropy is higher. If you just condition on like, say, the first k steps and try to predict like k plus 100 steps apart, the entropy is really high. And there's also one reason not to use raw generative model at that for really long horizons because if the entropy is too high, it's super hard to model. Even, even if you're doing something in the latent space like CPC, uh, the accuracy is for uh, anything beyond like seven or eight steps is really, really low, like 10% or something. Whereas things are much higher as long as it makes sense, yeah. Oh, 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 I see, I see what you mean. For, for, the, uh, for, for the downstream task you're asking? So, yeah, you yeah. showed a visualization where each speaker is embedded in yeah. space, right? Right. Uh, so, there are two, two different things you could use. You could basically take these different xt minus i's and pull those features and use those for TSNE. Or you could use the features that come from the autoregressive model and take the final, final context here as the global feature for the entire audio. I think for the visualization, they use the pool features. But you could, you could do both of, this, both, both of those things. Uh, in terms of like expecting it to be nicely linear in a lower dimension space, I would, I, would, I, would, I would expect that the pool features would be more apt compared to taking the output of the autoregressive model. Uh, can you clarify what you mean by pool, pool features? Right. So you have these different Z, Z's. So you can just uh, mean pool them. Yeah. I thought you said Yeah, pulling across time. Yeah. Um, all right. And again, the downstream task here is take the encoder from CPC and freeze it. Like, no, no more changes to that. Build a linear classifier to the speaker categories or phonemes and report accuracies. And Supervised is basically assuming that you just train regular supervised learning. And you can see that uh, CPC is able to really well on the speaker classification task, where uh, it's just like 1% lower than raw supervised learning, even though it had no labels. And on the uh, phon phoneme classification task, it's much lower if you use a linear model. So it means that CPC is not really able to recover very linear features. But in the paper, they report that if they use a MLP, like a two-layer MLP with some nonlinearity, uh, they can get it up to 72%, just, again, really close to the supervised part. Yeah. Um, so isn't, 
isn't the sequence of the, of the data that we're trying to predict going to be like fairly autocorrelated? Like, why doesn't the model just say the thing at t plus one or like one step in the future is the same thing that I've seen now? Yeah. So you, that's so. Panda's question was, uh, would like why would the model learn anything if like zt and zt plus one are going to be super close because the actual raw xt and xt plus one are very close. So in the model, they actually have a, a min prediction step and a max prediction step, which is how many st steps into the future you want to predict. And this min doesn't need to be one. And in practice, it's actually two or more than two. So yeah, so you don't, in practice, you, 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 you might not even have this pathway. Mm -hmm. You're only going to start from something that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And you're probably not going to go all the way into the, like, say, 100 or something. So there's actually a ablation where he reports that 16 steps, if you use 16 steps, uh, the accuracy is lower than using 12 steps. So, so yeah, sometimes it doesn't really help if you get noisy gradients from some really, really hard objective that you might not be able to predict at all. Um, or in technical terms, the mutual information is just really low between the context and the actual future because you don't really have enough context. So mutual information makes sense only if there's a commonality that the two things that you want to optimize for the mutual information share. Like in uh, colorization, uh, the actual structure of the image is shared. So that's why you're, when you're predicting colors from grayscale, something's happening. So some useful representations are being learned. But if you're predicting something that's not at all related, uh, uh, even though the prediction task might make sense, you just throw a lot of scale, you're not going to learn anything useful. Um, uh, okay, so that concludes CPC speech. Now, uh, about the visual representation learning part. Uh, CPC ImageNet is it? So, so the idea of writing the CPC paper was that they wanted to have one approach that works on different modalities, like image, speech, text, reinforcement learning, everything. So the, that obviously puts uh, the burden on the designer of the model to figure out what is the future and what is the past for different, modal different domains. So unlike, like say, if you had a generator model, uh, you would just not really worry about it because you're just going to generate everything. But here you have to worry about what is the future, what is the past, how are you going to condition it, how many prediction steps you pick. So those are things that they hard code. Uh, so in ImageNet, what they do is the ImageNet, let's say you had two to six cross two to six image. So you can actually construct these 64 cross 64 patches from it with 50% overlap. So they would just construct these different patches. And they would figure out, uh, they, they would get a grid of patches now. So imagine all of these patches were passed through a rest net and you got some, say, thousand dimensional embedding. And so, so you can basically think about this as some batch size cross. So this is seven cross seven. And each has 1,024 dimensions. So 4D tensor. So that's the embedding of the image. Now, uh, the autoregressive model is a pixel CNN on top of these, the meta grid. So that's, that's what I was talking about initially when I said, uh, unlike in uh, language, the atomic unit in computer vision is not really clear. And pixels is really, really hard to scale if you want to think about video scaling. So that was the motivation that if you could learn some kind of autoregressive model on patches, maybe some, something useful will happen. So the task is going to be as follows. Maybe, maybe I, I can show you probably the real image. So this is how it's going to look. So this is the actual image, some dog. These are the, this is the seven cross seven grid that you get. In practice, they add these, there, I don't know if you can notice, but uh, there are these black pixels at the borders. Uh, those are random crops that they do. Uh, and uh, what do you, what, so how the tasks look like? So what, for a prediction step, two steps ahead, it doesn't make sense to do one step ahead over here because you're basically sharing half the pixels between this and this. So if you're just trying to predict this from this, it's super easy. 
So they start from prediction steps two, 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 two prediction steps ahead. So the way the pixel CNN is implemented is there's no masking along the row, see along the column. So you would just use a regular one cross three column over here. And across the rows, you use a mass convolution of three cross one. So the embedding for this patch would be just this patch. For, 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 let's say the embedding for this patch would be including the context of like all, all patches in this row up to here. Uh, and, um, but for the uh, row wise, it's just going to include uh, the patches only up to the top. So it's not going to include any of this uh, as far as the embeddings are concerned. And for, you're going to do this for every single patch. And so you're running this tensor through a five layer pixel CNN. With, so the pixel CNN is implemented in this factorized way because you just want mask along one dimension. And you get an output embedding of uh, again, say, bat size cross, seven cross, seven cross, 1,024. One minor detail is for fitting things on GPU, the uh, pixel CNN is, runs on two to six dimensions instead of 1,024. But, but that's just an engineering detail. Uh, so how would the prediction steps, predict, how would the prediction tasks look like? Imagine you got to see all of the patches in this row. Uh, now I'm, ask, I'm going to ask you to predict this patch over here. And the negative samples would be, there are 49 patches in total. So there will be 48 from this image. And that would be 49 from the rest of the batch size. So if you use a batch size of uh, 16, you're basically going to get 16 times 49 minus 1 negative samples. So yeah, so 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 it's going to be a softmax over these many categories for every single batch, uh, every single patch, and every single batch in the, every grid. You have a bunch of truth and false. You're running a big softmax over corresponding categories. Yeah. Um, for each batch, is each batch within the same image, or like the batches? Are each batch or batch? Batch. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so you, you, every batch in the same image as well as every other image is a negative sample for you. So for this, for this particular, if you want to predict this batch, all the other patches in this image and all the other patches in every other image in the batch are going to be a negative samples. Uh, that's for ease of implementation. In, in reality, you might not want like negative samples of like, this patch or this patch for this, because you have 50 percent overlap of uh, with, for, for for this patch with, between these two, so it doesn't really make sense for you to have these. But if you have it, it's super parallel and easy to implement. Uh, yeah, because like to construct the true labels, you would just have to write uh, a TensorFlow identity matrix of that dimension. Um, and, 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 and so they, they, again, they have prediction, prediction steps of two, three, four, five over here. So for two steps ahead, you're going to have, uh, so for each of the first five rows, so you take the first five rows, and for each of the first five rows, you're going to predict two rows from that. So for this row, you're going to predict every patch in two rows from it as a third row. And, and for the sec, for the second row, using the context of the first two rows together, you're going to predict every patch in the fourth row. And for the third, and if you look at first three patches together, you're going to predict every single patch in the uh, fifth row, and so on. So that's the task. And, uh, and, and the more you see, the more easily you can predict. So for instance, if you've seen like the first five rows, it's, it might be possible that you get all of these right, because you've understood that it's a dog and the rest of the things are easy to get. But let's say you're seeing only like first row or something, and you're asked to predict the f third row, it might be pretty hard. Uh, and this is for prediction step two, the, the, the number of steps being two. If the number of steps is five, the, the task might be like, look at the first two rows, 
predict the last row, from, uh, basically have a gap of five rows and predict the last. So that might be really hard. Like, like if you just look at this part of the image and it, it looks like a dog, but you're not sure. Like it, you, you, you don't probably, you, you probably don't know how, how the mouth or the tongue looks like at the bottom. So that's why the uh, classification accuracy reduces as the number of steps increases. But the nice thing about this is if, you, if a task is hard, you just get to whatever level you can do it. That's it. Uh, so say if the entropy in, say, 10 steps ahead is super high, you, you predict how much ever is possible, and the rest, you are, uh, it's, it's not affecting you that you're bad at it. You, you, you're, you're, whatever bonus you can get from doing it, you get it. But uh, if, you're, if you're not able to do it, it's fine. So, um, so that's the idea of this uh, CPC. 2D pixel CNN running on the grid, yeah. So you say that it doesn't matter if we have like bad performance, but our goal is to get like an encoder to learn our presentations for some downstream tasks. So in a sense, we do care about getting the best encoder. Like yeah. The one that gives us the best representation. So like, yeah. it's not clear to me, like, it seems that the, the encoder that gets the best performance uh, is the one that we care about, and then like, why, why do we evaluate it on mm -hmm. the ones that we know are going to be bad? So, so, pa so the question was that if all the tasks are going to be bad, this encoder is going to be crap. But your prediction steps for if for the lower prediction steps, you're going to succeed. So, I mean, as long as you don't pick one step ahead, which is just cheating, as long as it makes sense. So, for instance, looking at the, for this part of the image and trying to predict some patch over here makes sense because you know that in the middle it's likely to be the uh, nose of the dog and you, you generally know how the nose of the dog looks compared to like eyes of the dog or mouth of the dog so you, you understand that <laughs> okay so you understand the uh, high level structure yeah. so but I'm just saying that it might be it, it, it's even not possible for you if I just don't show anything, if I just show this part, it would just not be possible for you anymore. Like, how would you predict that it's actually, I mean, how would you predict that it's, it's this specific breed of dog by just looking at the... Uh, I feel like if you really like dogs, you would be able to recognize it. Like, that's a bull, like, for example, if you showed me, like, the middle part, like, only a bulldog has those, like, weird, disgusting folds of skin. Oh, like, oh, I see. Disgusting. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> those, like, they're very particular folds of skin to, like, the, the bulldog. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So if you... So, like, the human is going through the process of, like, of taking this, identifying a larger image, and then, like, zooming in on what you might, like, ask them to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so that, that happens, right? If, if I, if I, if your, if your context size is including the middle part, now you're going to be able to get the rest because you know that it's a bulldog. But I'm just saying that if you only looked at the ears, super hard. It might be anything. It could, it could even be a cat. You, you don't know. Right. So, uh, Arvind, I got a non cat or dollar question. Um, <laughs> you, you talked about you always want to discretize to um, be able to capture multimodal. And here it's putting it in a continuous space. Right. What's, what's lost, if anything? And maybe you can repeat the question. OK. So Peter's question is that there are many possible futures, uh, like especially when the entropy is high. Uh, so and now, I, 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 earlier I was telling you that it's always good to be discrete for any, any predicting like things which are high entropy instead of continuous values. So his question was, why am I just using dot products and continuous things here? So to answer that, it's actually being discrete. Uh, your, these dot products are only going to give you logits, and you're still going to have softmax over like 784 categories over here. And uh, you're going to do this for so many different cases. So it's still a discrete task. Your loss function is just cross entropy. Uh, the, the embeddings are continuous, but your loss function is just a discrete softmax like soft cross entropy just like word to back um, 
So the best way of thinking about CPC is somehow someone figured out how to do VertiVac for images after a long time. And yeah. So one thing I want to point out, maybe if some people are inspired from this, is okay, first the left part, and then I, I would point out what I want to. Uh, the encoder, the encoder, in addition to uh, cropping and padding, the encoder sees only grayscale, not the color. So this is actually how the encoder would look like. I mean, the, this is how the patches would look like to the encoder. Doesn't make much sense to you, but for to to uh, AI, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, like the, it, it, it just figures out all these texture patterns over here. Uh, not very intuitive to you, though. Um, but the second part is something interesting, which is uh, this is something we look at next, but I, I want to say it in advance, which is there's no reason for you to do it in the row-wise future. Like, there's nothing that stops you from saying, so, so Pando is saying that if I just saw the middle part here, I know that it's a bulldog. But the way the model is constructed here is you only see the middle part if you saw the first four or five rows. But that, 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 that's just a engineering limit detail that you add. And in, in principle, you could just mask like uh, different patches, uh, like in the context encoder case we saw. Uh, but like, you know, make sure that you mask more than what you leave behind so that you can't cheat. And, uh, and then just try to like either identify the ones that are remaining in a contrastive way, or you know, like if you're ambitious, you could even try generating the uh, output pixels. Um, and you, you'll probably have to think about how to do it because it, 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 you, you, you need really large models and it might not really work. Uh, but this, this is a very sensible idea. So I want to get back on the evaluation. I think a lot of you asked, like, what the rot, when, we, when we're talking about rotnet, uh, what are the numbers? Like, are these on ImageNet? Are these not fine-tuned? So this one takes all the correct numbers. Uh, so if you use an AlexNet encoder, that was, that's what people were using before. Before, or, or rather, ResNet was already there, but all the work from Efros and other people were, were using very simple encoders. Uh, and there's no reason for you to stick with that. Like, it makes sense to even if use larger models for unsupervised and supervised. So, so, so these are numbers with AlexNet, the final convolution layer. And if you just take that and build a linear classifier, and you, you report the validation top one accuracy, it's like super low, uh, less 30 to 30, 35%. So you can see that uh, relative position works reasonably well. Uh, I don't know what video is, uh, but colorization works better than relative position. Jigsaw puzzles works even better than colorization. And there's this technique called BIGAN, which is also from Berkeley, uh, which, which learns an encoder of, along with the GAN together. And that, that, that works almost as well as colorization, but not as well as Jigsaw. So these were all done using AlexNet, which is extremely old now. Now, if you use a ResNet v2, uh, so by ResNet v2, what this means is uh, first three uh, stacks. So ResNet v2 has like uh, three residual stacks with like three layers, uh, I think four, 23, three, something like this. So, so each of these has hidden dimensions of like, so this has 1024 hidden dimensions and this has like uh, 512, 2 to 6, so on. So, uh, so ResNet v2 encodes these. Uh, actually, this has, sorry, 2048, uh, so on. So you stop here, basically. You just take the output of this. You don't, you don't use this. There is a reason for doing this. I mean, one reason is like your GPU memory, but the other reason is uh, ideally, you, if you're encoding, uh, an image for 1,000 categories, you might want to just hope that you have like approximately 1,000, like which is 1,024 uh, hidden units that can encode whatever is needed for you to be able to predict these 1,000. 
uh, but, but, that, but that this is just an aesthetic preference. Like, like you don't have to do it. Uh, so CPC gets 48.7, top one, which is like, say, close to uh, yeah, 9 to 10% more than the previous best. Uh, so, if you, so what is colorization here? Same colorization, but redone with ResNet. And you can already see like some improvements, like say previous colorization was 35, it went to 39 just by using a larger model. And all the other things too, relative position was 36, uh, earlier it was 30. So you just had five to 6% gain just by using a larger model. And CPC gets like 49, close to 49%. It's still far away. So AlexNet is uh, 63 point something. So that's still a sizable gap from unsupervised to supervised. But it, it's going to be minimized in the future just by training larger models. Uh, and this is the top five. People also report this. Uh, this is, so the CPC is at 73.6. And this combination of things is basically s multiple different uh, sub-supervision objectives that computer vision people came up with, like seg motion segmentation, relative position, colorization, exemplars. Uh, and, and if you combine all of these, and, and st you still get like lower than CPC. So it, it, it's nice that like one single architecture works much better than combining like several ensembles. And these are max patches that maximally activate different neurons in CPC. And you can see that it's learning all these textures, like, you know, like these uh, are calculators, keys, and car vehicles, phases, I think some grasslands, nets. So it's learning some things that are potentially going to be useful for uh, classification. At, and, and these, so, so like somebody else asked earlier, what are the features used for reported evaluation? Are these the pool features or autoregressive models features? The, these are just the features that you get for pooling all the, uh, so, so you have this grid of seven cross seven cross 1024. You just do a uh, reduced mean over these axes and get a 1024. So you just do spatial mean pooling. And, that, that, and then you build a linear classifier with that. Cool. Yeah. Is there meaning to the rows in the columns? Those figures? Not this one. The figure with the patches. Here? <clears throat> oh, which, which one? The one where you showed all the patches, the neuron activation. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, these are just like the top K patches that maximally activate certain specific neurons in the representation. So one row is one neuron? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One row is one neuron. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense because these are all nets and uh, you can see, of course, there should be dogs because I showed you a dog. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I don't know much about the specifics of these experiments, uh, but someone, very, someone who really works on this field says that these numbers are under grade, uh, but, uh, you know, like, the point of showing this is that it even works it, like for other modalities. Like it, it already worked for speech images. It also works for language. Uh, the architecture is super simple. It doesn't use any uh, self-attention or transformers or anything. It just uses GRUs, tries to predict like two sentences ahead. It doesn't even use that many steps ahead. So, so but, 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 but the, the point of this was that they, they used the books corpus data set train CPC, and then they would uh, you take these different downstream tasks that had nothing to do with the books corpus, like say uh, sentiment classification, uh, customer reviews on Amazon, and, and, and they would do better than the, uh, some, some baselines in NLP like skip thought vectors. Skip thought vectors actually tried to decode the future sentences, and that got like 82.6, so it's better than CPC. So maybe in language, uh, decoding might be the better, better choice. But it could be the case that if you use more modern architectures, say for the, uh, for, for NLP, uh, 
for G N, you could use a transformer. And for the G A R, the autoregressive model, you could use an RNN or, or you, you could still use a transformer for this, a mass transformer. So wh what I mean to say is G N could encode like one sentence or like say hundreds of words. And the high level G A R could be at the document level. So, so imagine like you're, you're taking chunks of words, hundreds of thou thousands of words, or even 500 words, and you can learn the, C you, can, you can force the CPC to run at sentence level or so many group of words level, so that whatever future prediction tasks you're doing are running at the level of big documents. And that's not done yet in NLP, because the focus so far has been on learning these huge transformer language models, like, like GPT-2, for instance. And, and that's not going to scale beyond like 1,000 words because of memory limitations on TPUs. So uh, maybe, maybe this, this kind of a model makes sense even in the language context. But the, the results are not really good. It was also applied in reinforcement learning. Uh, so I'm not going to go into details because we'll have a separate lecture for unsupervised RL. Uh, but just think about it as, uh, in, in addition to like policy gradient, so this is doing policy gradient, uh, A3C, uh, or rather A2C. And, uh, and then th this is doing, th the same encoder is being used for CPC and same LSTM too. So this encodes like previous reward and stuff in addition to states. Uh, encodes previous state, action, rewards, and so on. Cool. Uh, OK. Yeah, this has nothing to do with this. <laughs> There's this name for popularity. Uh, BERT is a giant transformer from Google that like, really pushed the uh, unsupervised learning front on NLP. Uh, so like I said already, language is the different thing. Like, in language, there's already well, very well uh, understood syntax. Like a, a word is very syntactic already. So you saw word to vec word to vec was doing this, embedding king or queen like words into like one big vector, 100 dimensions, 300 dimensions. The problem is it's very typical. Uh, I mean, the way, it's, the way it works is this tries to maximize the dot product between uh, neighboring words. In, 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 in contrastive to words that are not in the context window. And the problem is it doesn't have context. So these are two different banks. Like there's a river bank here, there's a bank account. You don't want to use the same embedding. So if you want an embedding for this sentence, and if you just average like the uh, word embeddings for each, each word, you don't want to use this WI for bank that's being used here shouldn't be the WI for bank that's being used in the river bank. So it should understand that there's a river over here. So that's solvable if you can encode with context. So the embedding for bank here takes into account the embedding for open and A. And the embedding for bank here takes into account on the river. So these vectors are different from just using word to that has no understanding about the context for bank. And hopefully these embeddings are better for downstream tasks. So that's, that, that's the hope. Uh, this idea is not new. Like people have, so once the original sequence sequence was done, people have tried like taking that model, train, it, train a really large language model on a lot of text, and then when, take data sets where there are not enough labeled points and start with the LSTM that you already learned from the language model and, and, not, and, and, and take the last hidden state and try to fine tune it on the uh, data set where you don't really have enough labels. And it, it was already showing some signs of success back then in like 2015. Uh, so one model recently called Elmo, which is also a character, uh, <laughs> I think, yeah. Uh, 
What it does is it takes, it trains two different language models, one forward, one backward, and concatenates the two embeddings to get a bi-directional sense and fine tunes this on the downstream task, like say sentiment classification or something. And, uh, and it works really well. Uh, so th so, th so th this develops the sequence sequence idea. Uh, and uh, just keep, keep in mind this, as well as the thing I said about the CPC patches that if you just care about embedding or representation learning, you don't have to restrict yourself to learn from left to right or past to future. So uh, this also ties in with what Jan LeCun said in his slide that you have to predict both future from the past as well as past from the future. It makes, it makes sense to do it. Uh, so all these were done, but they were not still like cutting edge. So then Alec Radford did this work called GPT-1. It was called GPT, but since it's GPT-2, two now I'm calling it GPT-1. And all, all he did was, so after the transformer model from Google Brain was developed uh, with, uh, you know, for machine translation, uh, he just took it, uh, trained a really large language model with v more layers, and more hidden units, and uh, some, some clever engineering. And after that, uh, fine-tuned it on a downstream task like sentiment classification. There are several other NLP tasks, uh, and it works really well. Uh, like e Compared to just raw supervised learning or other embeddings like ELMO, GPT-2 like, works way better. So, so this, this, this really caught the attention of people in the NLP community because like, this was a vertovec level success, uh, but with contextual embeddings, and also proof that large scale self-attention is gonna like, change the way NLP is basically being done. So, so, so Google people took inspiration from this and also from Elmo and basically said, you don't need to go from left to right Bidirectional embeddings are better. So let the word see every other word in the sentence or group of words and, uh, and basically uh, build this uh, model that's very, very much like denoising autoencoder. So imagine you had this sentence uh, and you mask this word and this word, have the rest of the words in the sentence and you're just going to predict the masked words. You're not going to predict the others. So that's not, so even in denoising autoencoder, the predictions for the uh, input dropout units were prioritized more with a penalty. Uh, so here, there's just going to be no loss function for uh, the uh, other terms that are not masked. And in the transformer, earlier, I think in the first lecture or something, you probably saw how the mass transformer is implemented by putting a big negative number in the softmax for the, before you take the exponent, uh, or, or before you feed into the TF dot and then that softmax, you would just add a very large negative number. Uh, uh, but so here you just need to do it for every position that's that you don't want to mask. So that so that that's that's the difference here. Instead of having a left to right assumption, you're, you're going to take the uh, indices that you sample for masking, and for everything that's not masked, you're going to have zero self attention. Okay, um, I'll switch to my laptop, uh, one sec. Doesn't the bidirectional embedding violate like all the autoregressive stuff we talked about? Violate in what sense? Um, as in the words, like in autoregressive we said, like the store, word in that sentence should only be able to see the stuff before it. But clearly, with the bidirectional embedding, it's able to see all the stuff after it. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to, like, as in, I didn't say you have to do it. I said it's good if it can. It's also good if it can see everything. I'm just saying the task shouldn't benefit, like, as long as you're not cheating on the task, it's fine, right? So what you mask? So because we don't have any loss on the non-masked terms, it doesn't matter if we like cheat by seeing those terms because it's not going to yeah, end up in all yeah, loss. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're predicting the, the ones that are already there, then the embeddings are going to get corrupted. Like, okay. yeah. It's the, it's not cheating because you're just generating the joint distribution. Autoregressive stuff is just a way of factorizing the joint distribution. 
exactly, yeah. You're not, so the point is you don't have to learn a generative model here. It's a, you can think about this as a conditional generation, but it, the, the, you're not actually using it for sampling. The point is, like, the GPT-2, like, went crazy because of the language model, but in terms of utility for NLP researchers, it's not the, all the text it wrote, but it's, it's the taking that model and fine-tuning it on another task. Right, yeah, exactly. So, so actually they have a collab notebook for you to do that, where you can actually write your own mask, where the mask is uh, like written such that, say you have a car is, and then you have mask, 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 and it's gonna fill the rest. So language modeling is a special case of this objective. Yeah. But it might not be as good as a pure language model because it's trained on several other mask versions, so it might, it might be okay but not that great. So how is the mask implemented? First of all, the masking is only done for 15% of the tokens. Uh, so it's not that heavily masked. Uh, and that's somewhat counterintuitive, but the way they explain it is that more masking just means like uh, too little learning. Like it does, it's not a, too high entropy to predict, not able to learn much. Uh, so only 15% of the words are masked. And among those 15%, the way the mask is implemented is 80% of the times you use a mask token and 10% of the times uh, you would replace it with a random word in the vocabulary. And so you can think about this as exactly the equivalent of denoising where you basically may ask, put it a noise. And 10% of the times uh, you would just keep the real word. So, and this is not a random choice. They, they ablated several versions of this. So th this is the one that works the best. Another task in addition to this mass transformer is predicting if a sentence B is a follow-up of the sentence A. In NLP, it's called entailment. So it's just a binary classification task where if sentence B is following sentence A, you predict one, otherwise you predict zero. And it's not actually sentences, even though they call it sentence. It's a, it's a chunk of 500 words. So it has to really understand what's going on. And these are the embeddings uh, for the words. So this is a word level model. And uh, you take the token embeddings, some segment embeddings with a particular. Uh, so I actually don't know how it's implemented. Uh, you can check out in the paper. Uh, then the position embeddings that, that regular transformers use. Um, and the data set is Wikipedia and Book Corpus. Uh, batch size is 1,024 sequences, which each sequence is 128 or 256 length or, or, or 512. Uh, uh, and, and then you have a training time of 1 million steps. Uh, you're going, you're train, they, they train it on TPU pods with, for four days, and um, architecture is the same as the original transformer. So how do they fine tune? They pre-train on a, this huge language, a huge mass language model, and fine tune on tasks like squad, which is question answering, NLI, uh, named entity recognition, uh, and uh, so, so that's that these are tasks where the data, the, the downstream task is the number of points is labeled that are, are really small. So you need the actual embeddings you learn from things like BERT or GPT to help you there. And these are numbers on this task called Glue, where uh, it's clearly doing better than OpenAI GPT on these uh, different num, yeah, oh, se several different. Values, I, I, so maybe Alec Radford, when he gives a guest lecture, he can get into the details. I, I don't really work on this, so I'm just presenting the high-level ideas. Uh, so, for instance, multi-NLI is this task where you have a premise and then you have a hypothesis, and you have to label if it's a contradiction or not. So, so it's it's actually really cool. 
because these are very logical statements. You have to make logical deductions. Uh, you know, people who are symbolic or big fans of symbolic AI, they would just say like, oh, deep learning can never do all this, just doing pattern matching. Um, but it's actually doing well. So pattern matching isn't a bad thing. Um, and uh, what, with respect to the, uh, whether you, 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 you need the uh, downstream, ta whether you need the entailment task in terms of how well the downstream performance is, it seems like you do. So uh, if you just use, the red one is when you, when you don't have the task and it doesn't work as well as the blue one when you use both the mass transformer as well as the entailment task. So it clearly helps. Oh, sure. Uh, cool. Uh, yes. And another ablation is uh, when you have a left to right language model versus mass language model, uh, it turns out that the mass language model initially is bad as far as pre-training steps is concerned, but after, uh, if you, if you, if, if you uh, pre-train for a sufficient number of time steps before starting on the downstream task, it works better. So, so this is something that uh, is kind of important to understand is when you, when, you, when you start on the downstream task, you don't have to stop doing your unsupervised objective, you can still continue to do it. So, so, that, so if you continue to do it, more, more steps of mass language model ultimately helps you to get a better final performance. So this is before they start fine tuning, it's how many steps they do before fine tuning? Or Sorry? Was the graph here showing the pre-training steps refer to the number of steps of training on the unsupervised task before you fine-tune to the supervised task. Right, 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 right. But now you're suggesting that when fine-tuning on a supervised task, you should also mix in your unsupervised objective yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so imagine you had a new data set, and you were, you were going to like, yeah, you don't have to stop, you, you don't have to just fine-tune on the supervised objective. You can, Continue your pre-training for a while, and then start doing your supervised learning. So your your new data set is also use you can you can use it for your unsupervised objective. And it turns out that if you do that for the mass language model for thousand steps or something, uh, it works way better in terms of the fine-tuning result compared to regular left to right language models. So you're just using the. Okay, let's say, let's say you trained on uh, a book corpus, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have Amazon reviews. I'm saying you don't have to just do sentiment classification. You can use the Amazon reviews and continue training the same mass objectives and entailment that you had uh, on, uh, on new data set. And then you can start doing the fine tuning task. How much does this depend on the size of your like, target, just for your like, target data set? Like if uh, it was like, uh, right, right. I see. Yeah, actually, I'm not the best person to answer this. Uh, so Alec is going to give a guest lecture. Hopefully, you can ask him all these questions. Um, cool. So I'll try to give a summary of the course next. Like, we've seen enough you know, self-supervised learning, unsupervised learning, gentle models. So I think this is important. Uh, we started off with this course, like then Peter presented this slide in the beginning, uh, and uh, we're, we're still only scratching the surface of this. So 10 power 14 synapses is more than, like, like it's 100 trillion. And uh, the largest model so far is, I would say, GPT-2, and it's 1.5 billion parameters. So we're not even like close here. We're, we're still like 100,000 X lower. And yeah, so, so we, we're not using data like, like if you have 10 power nine seconds and you think about how much of data we ingest, 
We're not training on that many large data sets. Even for text, we are still not trained on terabytes of text. We're only training on gigabytes. So uh, there's a lot more to go over here. Um, we've seen like autoregressive models, RN, pixel RNN, CNN, pixel snail, flow models, latent variable models, GANs, and then we've seen self-supervised learning. So all of these are covering different aspects. Uh, I'd like to just go through the progress over time. So made MNIST reasonably OK. Then pixel RNN comes like one year later and is able to do ImageNet, gets all these really nice textures. It doesn't get like coherent samples, but it's much, much better than like random, random pixels or random colors. Like these are, say, this looks like a sky, uh, you know, like this looks like a phone, but colors are not correct. So some kind of a thing, yeah. Okay. Make more sense to do it in one cohesive session. Yeah. In the next lecture, then hard now and then hard again later. This is trying to summarize and bring everything together. Okay, yeah. So that sounds good. Uh, yeah, I think for the next lecture, the first part is still like uh, lecturer's part, and only the second part is Ilya. So we, we can do like a 20 to 30 minute uh, quick run through of the course summary there.